Do you know what the best part about having your own podcast is? Uh, being able to speak into the void and feeling like no one's listening to you so you can say whatever deepest, darkest confessions you have. No, the best part. I, I would say that's the best part, but what is... Oh, that's the best part? The second best part. Uh, you can do whatever you want. You can make your own rules. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, and today I'm making my own rule, and I'm saying that Elvis qualifies for a remake, for an episode of Remake, Reboot, and Revivals, even though it's technically none of those things. Why? Because I fucking can. Mm-hmm. And that's about all I have to say for this intro. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right. I'm Nicole. And I'm Rolando. And this is Remakes, Reboots, and Revivals. An original podcast. About unoriginality. unoriginality. So hi guys, how are you doing? Awesome. Good. Eddie Z with us. He was not here with us last week. He missed out on Father of the Bride, but he is here for Elvis, which is exciting. Which I told him he would enjoy Father no, of the I, Bride. No, I wanted to be. I actually was, um, when Nicole pitched this, I was like, yes. Yes. Let's do this. See. And then. Yeah, because if you know me, and then I don't, I don't want to hear the word unfortunately right now. Because uh, <laughs> if you know me personally. You know that Elvis is a big deal in my life and stuff. Um, so this is going to be a really disclaimer. This is going to be like really personal. Oh, for me. I thought um, I think Eddie was talking about Father of the Bride. Wait, what were you no, talking about? No, Eddie? I was talking about Elvis. Oh, you were talking about. Oh, oh, he was talking oh, about Elvis. Elvis. <laughs> yeah. Keep up. Uh, I was saying, unfortunately, Eddie wasn't here to join us for something he oh, wanted to be a part of. That, okay. oh, oh, that's, that's what, what you meant. meant. Okay. okay. All right. Yeah. No, no, no. Lives. When uh, Nicole pitched, uh, <laughs> let's do this this Elvis movie as an episode. I said, oh, it's a great idea. Mm-hmm. I really, yeah, I've oh. been a big fan. So I would like to talk about Elvis too. I'm so excited. So before we kick things off, obviously, there's a big question that has to be had. And that's, you know, what everybody's relationship is with Elvis Presley. Mm -hmm. Uh, Did you guys grow up with him? I mean, I'm not even going to ask if you know him because he's pretty ubiquitous. I would say him and Marilyn Monroe might be the two most iconic figures Mm -hmm. of the 20th century. And crazy enough, they're both getting biopics this year. Um, That's like her like eighth biopic, though. I know, which means that we could also cover that oh, which is gonna be I guess, exciting i guess technically we can we technically we can because of the rules we're setting tonight but before we, we, get we technically that, selena it was our first biopic i <laughs> point that out well that was a direct remake though yeah it was like a weird remake but yeah it was like a weird continuation revival thingy uh-huh. i don't know um but yeah so what is your guys relationship with elvis presley Um, so I know Elvis more so like the myth, right? Like I know him as the joke, right? I don't know him. I didn't know him really as the star. I knew him as the fat guy who performed in Vegas, lost it all and died on the toilet. That's yes. So so ironic. Millennials are just like so cynical and ironic. That's like the perfect millennial sum up. I don't know if it was like a millennial thing, right? I think that was the boomer joke about him. That got passed down to uh, our generation. Like, they're the ones I who painted know. that myth in media that was pushed down on us, right? Like, it was, like, jokes on, like... I don't know if I agree with that. Yeah, because that was because a common also thing the boomers, on sitcoms. But that was the generation that loved him more than, like... And that was the last... Maybe... Big, like, he was alive during their Okay, generation. so maybe not... What's the generation after Boomer? X? Gen X. All right, so I guess it was Gen you, X. Gen Z? Gen N- no. Z? No, wait, de- Gen X. Yeah, Gen I think X. it's Gen yeah, X. Sorry. I think Gen X is... Yeah. Maybe Gen X is the one that, that perpetuated that myth of Elvis. Yeah, well, Gen X definitely set the template for the rise sensibilities of millennials, so we can definitely put it on them. Um, okay, so you knew him as a, quote, joke. Yeah, like Eddie, the washed about up, you, you know... Elvis. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So it's very funny. Um, so I didn't know. I, I knew him as like the musician that my my, my mom liked um, mm. very much. Um, I I do remember like I like, th- things that pop out. I I think I've seen all all his movies because they used to play them like Saturday afternoon. Hmm. And you know, young gay Eddie loving musicals. And this is what they were for me. You know, Elvis was just singing everything, singing his lines, you know. Um, so I saw so many Elvis Presley movies. Um, 
And I remember my sister doing it, it's so clear. I remember my sister doing um she's doing she had to do an uh, a biopic on someone for school and she chose Elvis Presley. And I remember the book. She had his like autobiography. Uh, no, excuse me, bi- the biography. And uh and her telling me the story about Elvis Presley. And I was just like really fascinated and sad that he died. So I, I remember being a little kid and her telling me that and so but uh, wow. yeah, so I knew his music okay. growing up. Um, I knew his uh, yeah, and I knew his movies. Okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So you had a pretty good picture of him. Yeah. yeah. Um, a way better yeah. picture than and I did going even, into this movie. Yes. So <laughs> random too. So <laughs> random. When I was a little kid, there was this like yard sale, like this uh, flea no, like a flea market, and I remember buying an Elvis Presley jigsaw puzzle like for a buck and uh, me and my sister uh and my mom just like just doing this like we never that was like the first jigsaw puzzle i ever did and uh with my family and i remember just doing it and it happened to be of elvis presley wow okay um Mm. uh, thank you for sharing that i actually never knew that about you eddie Mm. so um my relationship with Elvis goes as follows. My father was a huge, huge fan. Like, absolutely favorite person in the world other than his family was Elvis Presley. Really? And so okay. I grew up, yeah, I grew up listening to his music and watching his movies and just literally being told by my dad to come over, sit down and listen to this and, like, this one part in this Elvis song and then just, like, being made to appreciate it, which is, I think, also where I get, like, my deep appreciation for the arts from is because, like, my father would make me sit down and listen to things or watch things. And then my father died when I was quite young. Mm-hmm. And I'm a little sick, so also I'm not getting emotional. I'm literally, like, <laughs> I got a runny nose. It could be both. Um, it could be both, but it's more so you're, I'm going to be sneezing <laughs> all over the place. My father died when I was really young, and... I didn't really get to know him the way that I wanted to get to know my dad. But one of the things that I had was this relationship that he had to Elvis Presley. So like he kind of did pass down that fandom to me, but I explored it even more kind of like in search of like who my dad was. Mm -hmm. And then when I grew up and I realized that, you know, gender wasn't something that was coming like, like I felt more queer as supposed to gender. I didn't feel one way or the other and coming into who I was, you know, with my identity, I actually kind of, found Elvis comforting in the sense where it was like, I don't know what being a man or a woman is, but I want to be that. Mm. So in a weird way, Elvis also helped me shape my identity. So it's like this whole, you could say Freudian thing that I have with him, but it's a very personal relationship that I have mainly because I pretty much grew up with him and like was almost given an example of like, this is what it is to be uh, great Mm -hmm. in a way. Um, So, which is, you know, interesting because when i got older and i kind of read more about him and and learned more about him and like other people's perception of him or how or who he quite frankly was you know it was very like whoa how do i handle this because this is something that i associate with my dad you know it's kind of like that thing that you idolize when you're a kid and then reality uh comes in so um but that's my relationship so yeah so i i've seen almost all of his films i've watched all of his performances and i've read quite a lot about him Mm. And Elvis has been a big figure in media since his death. Uh, There have been many movie representations of him, downright biopics. Uh, But then he's like shown up in films like Forrest Gump. Right. Uh, He shows up in films like True Romance and like in Honeymoon in Vegas, (laughs) where the whole thing is that they're the flying Elvises at the end of that movie with Nicolas Cage and at Wild at Heart, where he does that whole Elvis thing. And then there's straight up... Oh yeah. Oh, uh-huh. good. Well, you're missing my favorite one, which was uh, Walk Hard. I forgot who played him. I think it was Jack White who played him. It was Jack White. Oh, yeah, but that's a such a huge Elvis fan. It's, and it's such, such a, a good performance. It's such a version, ridiculous, yeah. over the top yeah. performance. I remember whispering yeah. to Eddie, "I'm just like, I'm so mad at you for not have, having seen Walk Hard because I think Walk Hard's actually pretty good. It is. It's a good. <laughs> it's a good depiction of the seriousness that biopics have. And, and just and like how they're it. all kind of the fucking scene. they are and they are and like you know because as one of one of my favorite like go to comedies it's like watching the, it's hard for me to watch biopics after that this film yeah. included just yeah. saying but we can go go on yeah well I mean you know whatever a spoof is to do its job well but then sure totally still okay so 
Then there are straight up biopics that have occurred about Elvis. And some of them have been, you know, specific moments in his life. Some have been all encompassing. Mm -hmm. Uh, The first one to ever do that actually came out two years after Elvis died. Wow. Hollywood didn't wait. Elvis died in, yeah. (laughs) Elvis died in August of 1977 and immediately a biopic went into the works directed by John Carpenter, who had just come off of directing Halloween wow. in 1978. Starring he Kurt did Russell, right? A television movie. Yeah, yeah. With Kurt Russell, who's a huge Elvis fan, which is crazy. And that was the, f- uh-huh. I did, no, hearing that John Carpenter directed like a, you know, a TV film, you know? Yeah. Uh, it's actually really, really hard to find unless you like, pay some money to maybe Amazon or something. I was Did looking. Watch it? I couldn't even find it on Amazon. Yeah, it's really, really hard. I, I mean, like, you can... You found... I found segments of it on YouTube. Yes. But, you like, not the that. full. <laughs> yeah, it's because it's a TV movie, and, like, you know, TV movies don't get that cred anymore of, like, people don't want to watch them, so uh, they don't make them available. This would have been the perfect time to go to the archives of the Museum of Television. In the right? City. Oh, my God. <laughs> <Yeah>. Field trip. <laughs> uh, and it's so interesting because now, you know, we have streaming all these years later well no i was uh, uh, my imp- uh my opinion of the 1979 film is that we know who kurt russell became so it's hard to look in 1979 and be like wow kurt russell is elvis how could i see anything but kurt russell mm-hmm. but he actually does a pretty good job especially as young elvis and i think it's because he's such a diehard fan mm. um but he didn't do any of his own singing and stuff um which you know it's it's it, it always feels weird when like there is no level like there should at least be a balance of some of like natural singing compared to just straight up lip syncing you think i don't know i mean yes and no i think like usually they do that because they want to make sure it's the voice of the person mm. right but because okay. i know that was like selena in selena's goal like they didn't have j-lo sing i don't know if she could sing like selena right <laughs> but uh this is they, true yeah they they made that intentional they wanted to use her real audio because it's like her legacy so that makes sense as to why you want to use like the the person you're honoring their legacy well it's also most of the time it's a legal thing where it's like do do the does the estate give their blessing and allow you to use their songs interesting Um, because like a re-recording technically gets like a new would be like a new you you can get a th- that's a cheaper license like a re-recording mm. than it is to do like to get a license for the song right that's why taylor swift where her her courtroom battles with uh, her former manager or i don't know if it's a form- some guy that she hates right who owns all her music she's re-recording her music her discography right so to just fuck them over so that way <laughs> the radios really? play the new one you know they're, they're, they're identical right but she can do that apparently Wow, yeah. I didn't know that. Weird, right? Um, I don't. I, I you know, weird, any music yeah. lawyers out there, please chime in and let us know. <laughs> like, <laughs> yes, definitely give us, give, let us know what the deal is. Um, but I mean, it, it's interesting too because that film was like directly fresh from his from his death, mm-hmm. and it was the seventies still. You know, so it had. I think John Carpenter's great. I think he's one of the best American filmmakers, but it definitely had that kind of rose colored glasses, you know, right after something happens, looking at it through those like sentimental eyes. And um, I haven't seen the whole thing, you know, but it was, it looks like an interesting film and I wish, I wish I could get my hands on it. And if anybody out there is, has a DVD or something that they want to send us so we can watch it, I, we would love to, and we would appreciate that. Why are you saying we? I'm, I'll watch it. <laughs> I'm looking at wow. I'm looking at pictures of it. I'm just like, hmm, interesting. Yeah, no, Rolando would not appreciate it, so don't send it to him. But send it to me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there have been other film versions of Elvis Presley. Bubba Hotep with Bruce Campbell is a big one. Isn't that like? Is, but that isn't that like a fiction version? Yeah. Well, it's yeah, okay. but it's still very clearly <laughs> Elvis Presley. Like, There's been like there was a movie with Michael Shannon playing Elvis called Elvis Meets Nixon on mm-hmm. like the famous you know visit that he had with uh, Richard Nixon, which I was mad was omitted in Baz Luhrmann's story because <sighs> I know well there's a four hour cut that that's in oh really who played it didn't make it to the theatrical one who played I don't know who played Nixon oh, I'm they curious didn't... he just said that that scene does exist but it's in the four hour cut oh mm. is I, it also where yeah. Forrest Gump is too where Forrest Gump shows Elvis <laughs> how to move his pelvic. Yeah, I, I think that's also in the oh, four-hour this... cut. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, another movie, there's like a movie called Heartbreak Hotel yes. that like is about these kids. I've, you know that movie? I saw that 
Oh wow, you saw that. Yeah, about these kids like who kidnap Elvis so that Elvis can like be with their mom, I think. I've never seen this movie, but wow. uh, different representations of Elvis in film. This sounds like So Elvis but the, and like everyone it's so weird. Everyone knows who he is. All you got to do is like do something with your lip or just uh, thank, you, thank you very much. Dress a certain way and people know exactly what you're referencing. Recently in Everything Everywhere All at Once, there's like the scene where one of the characters just comes and like makes this grand entrance in an Elvis 1970s Vegas outfit. Mm-hmm. And that's simply because you recognize it and you immediately know what it is. Like he's truly who he is is ubiquitous and he has all these there's the vegas phase there's like the 60s phase and there's his his early beginnings and like you know he has these different looks that everyone knows and can identify them with and in a way though that elvis kind of representation for a while has been kind of uh, mute within our culture and i think that that's why i'm going to say that this is now why i can qualify this as a revival because we've revived Mm. the image of elvis in our pop culture, which has been kind of mute. Now, granted, I'm saying this from someone who lives in New Jersey, and I think also maybe our perceptions of who he is is because of where we live in this country. Every time I visit the South, I just see Elvis non-fucking stop. It's crazy. Really? He's everywhere. Yeah. He's everywhere in stores. He's like, he's like, uh, a, he's a tourist trap in some ways, mm-hmm. but he's also like on people's walls and like their windows and their stores. Like he's more so adored down there because he is also from the South. Right. Um, which also might hinder his, the pe- way people view him of like, if, if you look at the South as a negative place, then you might look at Elvis's representation. I don't know if we look at way, the South as a negative place. I think we look at their politics as a negative. I, n- I, I don't look at the South in a negative way, but I know that there are people who do, and then yeah, they I associate do. that do. with it. Yes, their politics you. usually, though, <laughs> <laughs> not the people in a broad stroke. Is just like, eh. yeah, yeah. Well, but it's interesting <laughs> because too the way that his his uh, legacy has continued on too has become he's he's become more controversial with where he was with his place in uh, history, right, and rock and roll history, yes, and. You know, being like so beloved in the South and stuff, I think it's kind of become like almost like this, you know, like millennials or Gen Z's don't give a shit about Elvis kind of a thing. Well, yeah, I I think part of it is that whole idea of his appropriation of uh, black music. And yeah, which is yeah, yeah, the the perception of his appropriation, yes, yes. absolutely. And I think that's where um, a lot of like for sure. I mean, I don't want to call them social justice warriors, but that's kind of what they are. Uh, who yeah. are calling? Who are who have definitely like made a big push against Elvis and stuff? And uh, I I I don't I can't speak enough to it because all I really know of Elvis was the joke and uh, anything that maybe Uncle Jesse said on Full House and now oh, this yeah, film. Yeah, he loved Elvis. Well, it was interesting because when they announced it, I was like. How are they going to handle it? Like, are they going to treat him like a tragedy like they did for the Judy Garland movie that I still refuse to see? The one sorry, Or are Renee they going to actually do him? Yeah. Because huh. um, it focused on, like, very, like, the last couple of days of her life and it just made her look like a drug addict and just didn't treat her, like, didn't treat her with respect, in my opinion. And that was, like, a big concern for me. Like, are they going to treat him like fat, drugged up Elvis? Or are they going to ignore how he got there mm. and, like, why he got there? Are they actually going to tell his story? Right. Are they going to do it justice? Because, you know, Judy Garland and Elvis Presley have a lot in common. Um, both were pushed into this industry by force at a very young age and were fed drugs in order for them to keep up with the be- busy schedule that they later depended on and mm-hmm. then ended their lives quite early. Yeah. Um, and that's a fucking tragedy within itself. And that's not like, that's more so... A, a problem of our industries that need to change and blah 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 i mean yeah look so, at britney spears <laughs> like you look at britney spears like, yeah like people think that that's something in the past but it's actually still very much no, happening still very much yeah so i was really worried when i heard about this elvis movie but then i heard who was making it mm. <laughs> it was baz lerman and if you don't know who baz lerman is he's only directed six movies and those six movies are strictly ballroom William Shakespeare's Romeo plus Juliet. You say plus. Moulin. You're so. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Ridiculous. <laughs> Moulin Rouge. I've never seen it. I yeah. can't stand you. We have to have a movie night. Eddie we just made a face. A uh, you know this about me, Eddie. I've never seen Moulin Rouge. 
and we have to you guys have to come here we will watch it on my surround sound the fact that i'm still with amazing. you just is a testimony of this undying love i have for you <laughs> that's like a perfect valentine's day maybe. you know i think it's mostly because i'm just i don't know i don't I, i'm already iffy on musicals but it's also like nicole kidman she and was amazing. Ewan McGregor. She's amazing. She was amazing. They're both amazing. They're so, they had so much chemistry. <laughs> it's so much chemistry. They're both wonderful on They're it. So, yeah. I mean, this is before she, all the, the poisons in her face, right? So, oh, yeah. No, she okay. looked so she, beautiful. Like a goddess. Organic, and, uh, when she walks yeah, down those like stairs, a it's like okay. a goddess. Uh, yeah, I'll check it out one day. I just haven't. I never saw it when it came out. I only know Moulin Rouge, the song with Christina Aguilera, Lil' Kim, Maya. Good song. Pink. Good song. In, yeah. In yeah. college, we used to have uh, annual Moulin Rouge screenings. We just get together nice. and take nice. over the the theater the that we had in the, at the school. No, that's. Fun. I love that. I wish we would have been fast friends in college. I swear. <laughs> totally, totally. <laughs> I when I first saw Moulin Rouge, it blew my mind. I like couldn't believe a movie could be that good. Um, I was also like thirteen, but still, it blew my mind. Mm-hmm. His next film was Australia. Um. And since then, I've seen all his movies in theaters. He gets me to the theater. After that, he did The Great Gatsby in 2013. Mm. And mm. it's been nine whole years without Baz Luhrmann in our lives. And finally, he's back. It's been nine years? Six movies. Yeah, nine the years. Great Gatsby really did him that dirty? Well, I think Elvis technically was supposed to come out in 2020. Oh, so technically, okay. it was a seven-year period. But he takes his time. He doesn't rush right. between his movies. Sure. Uh, I mean, if you've ever seen his editing... He needs to take his time. Oh, can't wait to talk about that. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, 2022. This movie was uh, announced in 2019. And I remember somebody asking me in my opinion about it. And, of course, I was like, I don't know how I feel about it. Tom Hanks is in it. I don't know how I feel about it. And I was pretty pretty hesitant. Uh-huh. Even with Baz Luhrmann, I was like, okay, it's got to be it's gonna be Baz Luhrmann. So it's going to be a fucking show. Right. It's going to be that what I call... Baz shit crazy style Mm -hmm. that he has and it could be potentially great or it could be a fucking fiasco and then they said Austin Butler was going to be in it and I had no idea who that was you're like who he is I think most famous for being on Glee he might be like a Disney Channel star but I think he was Disney Channel yeah but yeah but I Glee he was on Glee also yeah uh okay he was in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood for like five Oh, months. so Nickelodeon. He was a Nickelodeon star. Oh, there you go. So he was a child star of that generation. And he's, I guess he's trying to make his, you know, his his mark in Hollywood. Well, I don't but know. Like before it, Elvis, he didn't. Uh, yeah, no, he like, was. I mean, if I, as a gay man who follows gay, <laughs> like, uh, like uh, celebrity forums and stuff. Or just male celebrity forums, right? Like, mm-hmm. Austin Butler is a name that will show up because he's, like, hot. But no one has ever talked about, like, his acting creds here, right? So I wouldn't call him even, like, this is his big break for sure. But, yeah, you know, it. he, yeah, yeah. That's it. That's all yeah. I'm going okay. to it. All right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so the more, like, it got closer to June 2022, the more, like, I was just hearing so much about it. I mean, I follow a lot of movie websites and and film festivals, and the big thing was that Elvis was going to premiere at the Cannes Film Festival over in Nice, France. Mm. And the movie got a 12-minute standing ovation, which was the longest of that year, (laughs) which was the longest of this year's Cannes Film Festival. Um, No movie had gotten that long of an ovation. And that was like a big deal. It was like, oh, Elvis got the longest standing ovation. And, you know, people are saying all these things about it. To me, it was the movie of the summer. I mean, mm. I just heard so much about it. I was hearing all these things. Austin Butler does his own singing. Uh, oh, so he does movie, his own singing. He does his own singing as young Elvis. Oh. Um, the Priscilla and Lisa Marie actually give their blessings to this movie because they have been, you know... Uh, Paid. There's been a lot of representations of Elvis over the years that they have not been an approved that they have not approved mm-hmm. and they actually went on tour to promote this movie yeah that's they got how it. much so that they gave their approval for it you say gave their approval but it sounds more like right, they made yes. a penny <laughs> out of it oh i'm sure you know the promotion for them is good and stuff but they it's not like they uh oh, how, they didn't want to be any part of it they it, were the saying, willing girl? participants what's good for the goose is good for the gander I don't know where that applies. Is here. that a saying? Think, yeah, it is a saying. <laughs> yeah, like, what's it called? What does that like, apply here? So, because 
El- this will elevate the Elvis brand, and as the I'm sure the owners of the El- Elvis estate, it just means mm-hmm. more moolah down the line for them. Well, mm. fucking duh. I'm just saying that's how I it mean, applies, yeah. Eddie. No, I think you're still using it wrong. <laughs> no, I think you're using it <laughs> what wrong. What about this one? About all ships rise with the same tide? No. No? Is that also... Whatever. It's good for the bread. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, if you've ever been to that part of the country and you wanted to visit anything Elvis, you I mean, the brand of Elvis is a little out of control. They turned Graceland into a fucking theme park. And I, you know, I just wanted to visit his house because... It's a fucking, it's a certified national landmark. Mm-hmm. And also it's like kind of like a pilgrimage for rock and roll fans. And they turned it into just like this huge fucking thing that was so annoying. Was it annoying? Um, so oh. I don't, I'm not surprised that like the people who control his brand are like, oh, it's going to be good for yeah. the brand. We Is it anything like Dollywood? Well, Dollywood's an actual theme park that oh. isn't like based around her house. Oh, it's not based. Okay. I do want to go to Dollywood. Yeah. And Dolly Parton's still alive and like controls it. Like Elvis is long dead. And That's these are true. people who are like, let's take his house and turn it into a theme park. Um, the Elvis When I say estate. theme park, it's like a museum and then all this stuff. Like, yeah. I, like you're saying theme park, like I'm imagining like rides and stuff. Well, you have to take a shuttle bus to get to it, and you have to go through like yeah. uh, his grandma's restaurant and Vernon's car shop or whatever. Is like, his grandma's Vernon's restaurant his up and running? Like I could buy like I don't know biscuits. I assume you could buy his famous peanut butter, butter banana, banana, and bacon d- sandwich. Mm. Yeah, Ew, that sounds awful. Oh my god, <laughs> banana <laughs> bacon. I think it's a bacon that's throwing me off. Well, it sounds like sweet and savory. Okay, maybe I, I would give it a try. Sweet I, and savory, like, I remember yeah. seeing that recipe. In like a cookbook, like it was called the Elvis mm-hmm. Presley favorite. Yeah, 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 he, yeah. He he loved his uh, grandma's cooking, uh, and that was like a favorite of his. And that's like <laughs> something that people like to make fun of him for. But so anyway, this movie, right? First, we want I want to talk about the overall thoughts of this movie, and then we'll talk about the performances, okay. and then kind of like the representation of Elvis, which I guess is something that if you have any questions, I'll answer, and I'll give my whole two cents on my. Uh, the things I liked and the things I didn't like. Yeah, as the in-house Elvis experts, you'll answer yes. our questions. Okay. Uh, first, I, I definitely will. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I'll go with my first thoughts. I think the first act was absolute trash. And it wasn't until the second and third act where I was just finally like in the show. I thought focusing on the quote-unquote villain of the story, but hearing his point of view and thinking himself the hero was probably one of the smartest choices for a biopic I think I've seen. I will admit mm-hmm. this, I haven't seen many biopics, but out of the few that I have seen, I think that was a very ingenious way to tell this story. I think it worked, in my opinion. Like, that that frame... No, hang on. I hated the framing device, but I think overall it worked. From a writing point of view, though, I do think... Us realizing early on that, like, uh, Colonel Sanders, no, Colonel Colonel Tom Parker, Colonel Tom Parker is a villain because you knew that very early on was like this, like, kind of gross villain. I think there might have been a little bit better payoff if the story was told linearly and, uh, you know, like like a traditional biopic. And, uh, we developed this friendship with, uh, with the Colonel and Elvis and feel that betrayal in the third act. I think it would hurt more, but because of how they handled it, I think that sting, it was, it wasn't as impactful in my opinion in the third act when like, when like all, when all wounds come, come out, right? Like when we realize like Mm. how fucked Elvis is, uh, he is when I, you know, we already knew this because we were literally told in the first act you know what I mean? Mm, yeah. So yeah. the impact, it lost a lot of that that sting for me. Okay. Uh, well, I agree with you about the framing device, um, especially having Vegas be representative of kind of like this weird purgatory, mm-hmm. uh, mm, you know, where yeah. uh, where the colonel is living and he knows like also where he kind of enslaved Elvis later on in his life. Right. And that's where he's telling a story, doing the thing that he loves, but he can't an- actually get any satisfaction out of it while he's like a, a met like, uh, in hospital gown with the IV bag, yeah. just like the visual aspect of it, I was like, Baz Luhrmann's fucking back. <laughs> I, uh, just I don't know. So happy. Vegas as a purgatory like state, I think mm-hmm. works because, from what I am told, when you're in Vegas and you're in the casinos and you're underground and all that stuff, 
it, you, yeah. you have no sense of day or night, right? It feels like this mm-hmm. everlasting... Uh, neon lights. You know, and, yeah, yeah. Like, they, they built them that way to keep you in there for as long as possible. Yeah. So that made sense. Hold you. You've never been to Vegas? No. Me and Eddie are trying, to, I'm planning, yeah. I'm trying to plan a trip. I have. So I can oh, give you testimony okay. to that. There is that okay. feeling of it is this perpetual time, uh, mm. but no time. And everything, yeah, it's just like bright and flashy. So it kind of draws you in. Bright light city gonna set your yeah. soul on fire, huh? So yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. So I would say though would the, the, but overall for the film, those are my overall thoughts, right? Like I think it was okay. I think the first act was probably the clunkiest, and it's not until the second act when like we finally th- there's a better pacing by the time we reach the second yeah. act because that first yes, act yes. was absolutely crazy. It was just banana non-stop. towns, yeah. yeah, like no sense of time. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Okay. Yeah. Like I had, um, I couldn't tell you like what point in time we are in, right? Well, so I'll say the first ten minutes that set up like you know where it's like it starts in the middle and like he's in Vegas and and he collapses and they're like he has to get on that stage and then it's like it's going back and forth between Colonel Tom Parker's mind and and fantasy and all of this and the, the way that it set it up I thought was wonderful and i was just the moment it began i was like oh my god i was i was just taken with it and i i i i don't remember the last time i've experienced something like that in a movie theater of that like caliber i was also in a dolby cinema so it just sounded unbelievably incredible um but it was just like top fucking like filmmaking like everything was just crazy moving wonderfully and then it got chaotic i agree after those first like 10 15 minutes when we started going back to like his youth mm-hmm. and and we started meeting elvis presley and like colonels where the colonel tom parker was before him everything was kind of like oh my god i need to take a breather right and we don't get a breather for <laughs> it's like an hour and a half in yeah which is crazy because like for a two and a half hour movie in parts i was like okay this feels long but it doesn't oh it like is a weird like Uh, it's you you're aware that it's a long movie but it's also like moves so at a frenetic pace that it's like how how can this like how is this already over in a bizarre way interesting because like i felt by the end of this film i I felt like halfway through the film i was just like wow this movie's so long i can't like it's so long and by the end i was just like wow this movie was incredibly long i like my time it's like oh it's only two and a half hours long it felt this movie felt a lot longer to me now is that because you just prefer watching things and pausing them and like paying half attention or is it really because like do you feel like this was a pacing issue is it like i think it was i honestly do think it was a pacing issue on this one because okay. and I think maybe because so much of the movie was like the pacing was very erratic all over the film, right? Yeah. Like it wasn't like yeah, the first act was probably the most erratic, but it doesn't mm-hmm. stop being erratic, right? Like there's just moments do- when we mean, get a well, little bit of downtime, and then it's just all of a sudden like crazy amounts of cuts and stuff, and then like now we're yeah, back I mean, into yeah, then we're back into like a slow portion, then crazy amounts of cuts, and then by the end I'm just like Jesus yeah. fucking Christ, like where where am I? <laughs> I mean, as an editor, I'm just astounded by how they made that fucking. <laughs> I was like, the editing is so crazy. I think um, some of the editing was crazy. I think some... So I had... My biggest issues were sometimes the dubbing was so terrible where you could oh, see... Oh, wow. You didn't notice this? There were points where, like, I did not on the wide that. where, like, Tom Hanks or, like, Elvis are moving their mouth, but they had the audio in <laughs> And I was just like, ew, why would they do that? Like, oh, get me a different angle. When I go angle. see it again, I gotta pay attention. Check it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are very... Those, that, yeah. It happens, like... It happened way too much when, like... <laughs> Okay. Okay. Um, but it's also crazy because I'm like, oh my God, this two and a half hour trail, like everyone's like saying it's a two and a half trailer and stuff. I'm like, uh, is, is that a bad thing? But also like, how can this movie be too long when I feel like it kind of needed to cover more things? Well, interestingly enough, it's a like, good I was co- like, I mean, oh, I yeah. actually needed more here. I needed more here. I needed more here. Yeah. Like I needed more of uh, Richard Nixon. Right. And <laughs> meeting Elvis Presley to become the drug czar or whatever he was. So these are the things I needed more of. <laughs> I needed more drug scenes. I needed more of the fact that of how he got addicted to drugs and why like pills, right? Pills mm. to wake you up, pills to put you to sleep, pills to give you energy. 
Those are the pills he was addicted to. Yeah, and they kind of... He couldn't function without them. And they drop those early in the film. Like, uh, in the very first act is when we see Elvis taking a pill for the first time, right? Yeah. And then we don't and see another... Get... Yeah, then we don't see another pill for, like, until the third act. Yeah, and, and then, like, Priscilla leaves him because of it, but we don't see enough scenes of, like, actually the pills affecting his day-to-day life or him relying on them. We don't really see yeah, that. I would so agree. that's my big thing. Um... And to me, that's actually something that people don't understand enough about Elvis. So I was like, this movie didn't make them understand that more. Um, That's why he got fat, because he got bloated from his pill uh, addiction. Um, Two, maybe needed a little bit more of Fat Elvis, what the pills did to him and his body at the end. Like, although I'm glad it didn't focus too much on him, because it's also, he wasn't fat until like the last year of his life. All right. I saw. But that's because he was on, you know. Video footage of him. Let's be real. Like, he seems like an average person. <laughs> like, I know, right? Like, By today's standards, he yeah, seems like, pretty damn It was just like, oh, this was so fat. Like, look at the footage. It's just like, he looked like just a middle-aged he man. Wasn't like, that what fat. But, like, yeah. you know, for, like, the most beautiful, iconic man of the 20th century, just for him to gain any weight was, like, a travesty. Oh, that's so interesting. I never found Elvis handsome. I love Here's his hair. Him. I think he had great hair. But you don't think he's like even when he smiles, he's not attractive. No. You know, the only old timey star that I've really found ever hot was Marlon Brando. He was hot. Yeah, yeah he's he was stupid hot. hot. Yeah. Even like James uh, Dean, I'm like, eh. Well, yeah. Well, James Dean though was more. You know, it's so funny that you say James Dean because that was Elvis's idol, but um, he was more feminine, and James Dean was also bisexual, and he wanted to bring that vulnerable uh, representation of a man to films yeah didn't marlon brando and him marlon brando did not but they hooked Um, up there's like rumors but maybe because marlon brando is like infamously pansexual um eddie do you find elvis yes attractive yes i find elvis attractive Uh, interesting uh i even so so on tiktok one of the tiktoks i was following like had a clip of him like in a shower scene and i was just like ill (laughs) i don't know if you (laughs) oh yeah from gi blues yeah i don't know if you saw if you caught it um well definitely you caught it remember when the it was like, it was like a senator person having a meeting, and his daughters and this kid are like this guy are like watching Elvis on TV, and he's like, "What is this?" Do you remember that? Yeah, scene? yeah. The, when the senator first takes notice of Elvis and the and the pelvis. Oh yes, yes. Uh-huh. You saw, the how, kid, you saw the how, how the guy was like, just like absolutely captivated, <laughs> yes. and yes. then I, yes. and then I don't think it's the same guy, but. I, I, it's interesting to see that that was thrown in the mix. There's a scene where Elvis is performing and mm-hmm. all the girls are in the front are screaming, throwing their panties. And there's a guy like slap right in the middle. Also just yeah. like smiling. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I appreciated that. Um, <laughs> that scene was funny though. The previous one, because typical, typical, I don't know if they were Republicans yet or how they were identifying, but typical, typical Southern conservatives here. Like, you see children having fun, and all of a sudden, it's the devil. Yeah, no, it's funny. It was like... It was the dumbest fucking scene. Why are they happy? Like, why are they laughing? Why are they laughing about? Like, it's just like, God forbid. God forbid children. Right. So, story-wise, when Elvis steps into the scene um, in the movie, and Colonel Tom Parker, is, he's uh, an agent or publicist or manager for some country act... Hank Snow, I believe. Mm-hmm. Uh, Elvis comes out and he's just driving everyone crazy because of the way he moves. And Baz Luhrmann really wants, like, he almost hits this point too hard, but he wants you to know just how much he shook up the scene. And that's why he became, I think, so famous is because he caused a lot of controversy. His nickname was Elvis the Pelvis. Right. Because he moved in a way that was con- was considered highly sexual. And it is still kind of sexual. Yeah. And that it was for a, for white audiences, uh-huh. <laughs> they had never seen this before. And that's where the controversy then comes in from Elvis Presley because Elvis is influenced by black artists and musicians. Yeah, I will. And, oh, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Well, I was just going to say, and then the whole story, too, is that Col- Colonel Tom Parker almost views him as like kind of a circus performer. Right. In a sense where it's like he's his meal ticket because he's he like activates all of these like strong emotions in people well and it's because he's trying and because elvis as there's so much to say here but like pretty much he's become someone who everyone looks at him and it's like he's someone who can bridge the gap between you know the black music scene and the white music scene and actually bring these two things together more in like mainstream american culture mm-hmm. 
Do you remember what we saw Nightmare Alley, right? And they talked about how do they make a geek, right? You get a guy, addic- make him addicted, and then he's going to depend mm-hmm. on it. There was like this mm-hmm. one shot, which I thought was a little bit, I guess, on the nose now that I have seen uh, Nightmare Alley. But like he's standing in front of the geek sign, and it's yeah. just like, oh, yeah. I get it, because you're going to get him addicted, obviously. <laughs> Had we not seen Nightmare Alley, would we have gotten that? No. Mm, good question. Probably not. Not, not, not probably as deep not. as that. Yeah. I would have known the too. geek as like the the sideshow attraction, but now how you get them yeah. to become geeks. And even the colonel, yeah. I got a different, I got a deeper perspective on him because he kept on bringing that up. You know, I'm a carnival man. You know, I I know yeah. how to do the yeah. snow job. You know, so I, I, you got that. You know, it's it's all about smoke and mirrors. You yeah, which is interesting. Yeah. Well, I got while well, I'm distracting you here, I'm taking all your money, and that's what he kept on saying too. You you get them mm-hmm. all excited about your show. And you take their money, and then they walk away yes. with smiles. Yeah, so. yes. Now they keep calling it a I, snow job, which was perturbing because I know it is something else. <laughs> Rim shot. <laughs> <laughs> um, but storyline rise for Elvis. You know, he becomes this almost cultural figure, and like he's used as like you know, yeah, in politics and everything as like. Uh, a talking point and a reason for segregation, and all this stuff. And Elvis is just a little Southern mama's boy who just really wants to like make music and, and, and he reads comic books mm-hmm. and you know, he, he attends church and he just wants to like be like the guys that he's grew up watching and idolizing. Right. Much like the drag Queens in Texas are being used as like a scapegoat by conservatives. Yes. So yes. for sure, I will say Basil Lerman's best scenes are probably like him showing Austin portray the gyration and kind of the pandemonium that it's at. Like those are probably the strongest parts of the film. Like that's where he really showed you. He showed you like what Elvis is. Yeah. Or, and especially how he was perceived and why he was, I guess, important Mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, when he came out in the late fifties. Yeah. Um, and then a big, uh huh. I just I'm like reading this article. Um, so we're recording a podcast. <laughs> I know <laughs> it's because I wanted to get a, r- a right name of this Elvis phenomenon where th- you know that happened in the beginning of his career where um, the girls would hear him and see him and they would just go hysterical. They would scream and scream and scream. Mm-hmm. So uh, interesting point was that it, it would get so loud with their screams that the band playing could not hear Elvis sing. Oh. They Crazy, could not huh? hear Elvis sing. So they actually kept beat by the movement of his ass. Oh. So the way really? he was so moving funny. moving is how they kept beat to the song because after a while they Look could that. not hear him. Anymore. That's so funny. Wow. Why didn't Baz yeah. Lerman include that? <laughs> this is, yeah. No, they, I, I well, also, it, like. Go on. Uh, go on. I mean, just look at the like the repression, though, you know, that like America was dealing with in that time that like th- look at this little boy here just like shaking his ass because he's like what? He was 19, 20. Mm-hmm. He's still a very young man and he's just shaking it. And everyone's going insane right. over it, um, which is. Yeah, it's just it's, it's crazy. What were you going to say, Rolando? Um, I don't remember. Yeah. What was yeah. it? What, what was it about? Well, when did I? Oh, to to Eddie's point. About, I don't remember. Let's just move on. Yeah, we can move Um, on. And so at some point, Elvis is a phenomenon. Like, you you really only get certain things like that in culture where, like, just something hits and it hits the pop culture complex bone so hard that it defines it. Yeah, like the Harlem Shake. Yes. Like, yes. (laughs) Uh, Like, Ed Sullivan censored Elvis and only shot him from the waist up. And Steve Allen put a suit on him, like one of the big scenes in the movie, you know, because it's like everyone's got to clean up Elvis. But Elvis doesn't really need cleaning up or changing. But the colonel thought so and sent him off to war. Or at least to the army, not to war. Yeah. It was a big thing. War was he fighting? (laughs) He just went to the army. Yeah. Like, it's 1959. Korean War, maybe? I don't, but did he actually find the career? He was in Germany. No, he just went to the army <laughs> okay. and he like did his time, oh, I see. but he never fought. Um, and it was a big deal. And that was kind of like, you know, the Colonel's big plan to get uh, the main, sh- like parents to like him as much as they got kids. I mean, he was such a phenomenon. They wrote a musical about him called Bye Bye Birdie. And, Is that uh, what 
Bye Bye Birdie is about Elvis. Yeah, it's about Elvis going off to war. That's Conrad Birdie. We love you, Birdie. Oh, yes, we do. Oh. Yeah, it's Conrad Birdie get shipped off to war and everything. Oh, mm-hmm. I didn't. I thought there Bye Bye go. Birdie. So Bye Bye Birdie is about Elvis. Isn't that yeah. the one with... Uh, did we talk about this before? I thought Bye Bye Birdie was like a Western. No? No, Bye Bye okay. Birdie is not a Western. <laughs> uh in the war, he meets and falls in love with Priscilla. And then when he comes back, Colonel Tom Parker then embarks him on a very long time of a movie career in which Elvis does not make any uh, concert performances mm-hmm. and just makes all the music that he makes is solely for the movies that he does. He makes about 27 films in eight years. Wow. Long, 27 right? in eight years. Jesus. Okay. Yeah. And from you know when he comes back in 1960 to 1968... He's pretty much lost touch with the 60s, which is why his comeback special was so important. Um, And the movie kind of shows why that was important while dramatizing other things. And then after that, he's back. He's no longer making movies. He's now a performer like he started off. And he has big plans that he wants to tour the world. But because of the Colonel Tom Barker being a really interesting, confusing, illegal Mm -hmm. maybe person in this country... He does everything he can t- he can to keep Elvis from not leaving this country because he can't. Colonel Tom Parker cannot, and instead to feed his gambling addiction, right. has him do residency after residency in Vegas. Now Elvis does tour um, the country a bunch in the seventies, but his big th- thing is a Reagan's Vegas residency that he does year after year at the International Hotel. Uh, he does do a 1972 satellite concert from Hawaii, and that was the first time that that had ever happened. Mm-hmm. Something that the movie kind of just barely mentions, but uh, that was a big it. deal at the yeah. time. Yeah, and my sisters, my older sisters, have told me how much of a big deal it was for my father. Yeah, apparently one and a half billion people. It's crazy. Yeah, it's huge, and that's that huge that outfit, that 70s outfit that everybody knows him to have is from that concert. Mm. And then. Um, Elvis dies in 1977. That's pretty much it. The movie, I mean, it focuses really hard on some aspects that I just shared. It focuses for only five minutes on some aspects that I shared. Mm -hmm. Um, So, again, those were my complaints was that we kind of needed more of his drug addiction that he was introduced to. I mean, I know it really became a problem in the army because he was always exhausted. And actually somebody in the army was like, take this pill. Take speed. It will wake you up and give you the energy you need. Oh, is that the pill that people were taking? I was wondering, like, what pills were they getting addicted to? Because I thought opioids and stuff was a recent problem. Yeah, they're like uppers and downers, essentially. Mm. And uh, the uppers were, like, like really, like, if you are exhausted, this will make you, like, uh, awake. Man, let me tell you. Do what you got to do. What I would do to get my hands on some of those uppers. <laughs> <laughs> well, you will get addicted. <laughs> Haven't you watched any biopics? No. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I I do wish it had a little bit more with uh, Priscilla, uh, but that's something I'll get into in a little she bit has later. Her own, she has her own movie. Uh, Elvis and Me. Oh, she has the book. I've no, I've it's book, also a movie. But, oh, I've never seen it. Yeah. Uh, and there are other things that I didn't think needed dramatizing that it did, but overall, I quite enjoyed the movie. Did you guys enjoy it? Um, I I liked it. I was like, so I did think the movie was way too long. Like I said, at the, I thought like by the end, I was just a little exhausted. Um, but I, I think overall, so this is an unpopular opinion because I already know that you hated this performance. But for me, this was a Tom Hanks film. <laughs> like I thought he was, <laughs> I thought he was so good in this film. And truly, oh truly, goodness. truly, really, really, I was like, why wasn't he playing the penguin in the Batman. <laughs> you know I mean? No, and you know what it is? It's because so rarely, I don't think I've ever seen a film where Tom Hanks is the Batman. villain. Yeah. Do you, as as the movie buff, Nicole, <clears throat> can you do? You, have you have you seen? Can anything come to mind where Tom Hanks plays? Yeah, he was the antagonist. I'm pretty sure he was a villain in Road to Perdition. No, Road to Perdition, he, it was a father-son movie. Yes, he did bad things, but he was still the protagonist and very much uh, the hero in his child's eyes. I mean, I haven't watched a lot of recent Tom Hanks movies. No, uh, even re- so the reason was choices, that I... Have, so yeah. I don't know if he's done it recently. Yeah, but, but as far as... Technically speaking. It's, it's yeah. rare, if ever, right? 
So yeah, so I think seeing this side of Tom Hanks's performance, that sliminess, I thought I thought it worked for me. Like he truly, like every, he really did disappear into the role. Prosthetics aside, I thought he did great. And it is his, and you know what it is, his performance with Austin Butler's truly is what made this movie like kind of very enjoyable. Like I think they had great chemistry together, and I think his sliminess with. Uh, uh, awesome butler's naivete it just worked interesting okay yeah um yeah that's a that's a hot take because i did not i w- i didn't i won't say i hated it but i didn't think uh he did a good job as a colonel um mainly because i was like oh my gosh tom hanks is really given this accent all he's like he didn't disappear it's so funny you compared him to the penguin because i did not see colin farrell at all when he portrayed the penguin, I saw fucking Tom <laughs> the entire time as Colonel Tom Parker. Um, now, granted, he actually had an easier job because not a lot of people. I don't think there's any recordings of the Colonel. We don't really know how he spoke. Um, like we just penguin. know the stories about him, <laughs> and we just and we don't even know fully like his story. I mean, we kind of do. Yeah, we have like now we, we filled in some um, blanks. Apparently, I didn't know that he was a man yeah. with no country. <laughs> so yeah, essentially, yeah. So he he kind of had the freedom to do whatever he wanted. And I was like, oh, that's a choice you made. Okay. I liked his choice. <laughs> I thought his choice was well executed. I, yeah, I found myself like very much, because you had told me this before I had gone to see the movie that, oh, Tom Hanks is terrible in it. So I was expecting to see like a train wreck. And I was just like, oh, I, by I the end think of the movie, you liked his performance just so you could disagree Despite you, me. possibly. <laughs> Wait, Eddie, how possibly. did you feel about Tom Hanks' performance? I actually did. I like, I actually Tom Hanks. And I didn't I tell did. him you that did? you didn't okay. like it. Yeah. I actually did. Because we were talking about, I, okay. I felt like, okay, Tom Hanks, if he's going for super creepy old guy, I'm, he got me. <laughs> he got me. <laughs> yeah, he just like kind of disappeared in like the body language and everything. Like he really just like, he was so totally, gross. Every time, every time he, was on screen, he was on the screen, I felt uncomfortable yes yeah disturbed by his presence agreed totally i was like please just get rid of him already <laughs> just get rid of him yeah. he's so gross yeah. the way he's what he's doing to elvis presley he's just like this is something i didn't really know i didn't know at all about this kind of relationship and what 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 happened and how he shaped this and how how um the international was like really a jail for elvis it was yeah. so weird just to know that. It's just like, oh my. And it's like, what would have happened if we would have had an international Elvis Presley touring the globe? Like, what, what, how would that, it, would have if changed If he actually things? left Colonel, if he, yeah, yeah, if he had left the Colonel and had a different management, you know. And the last. he have yeah. survived. You know, if they didn't make his dad his, the, uh, the, the business, business better. The business. <laughs> you were supposed all. to be watching the money, daddy. I think that's what he says. Something, yeah. <laughs> something like that. Know, I did chuckle like at that part. I was just like. like proper s- representations. I mean, the way the son was really caring. Sun Records mm-hmm. was really like, really caring and really like. Oh, they got a payday too, though. I just want to remind everyone about. Oh yeah, this. yeah. Like, I mean, he, but it's all part of the plan. But I'm yeah. in the same the sense of like, you you got in that brief moment you got the sense that the Sun Records had Elvis Presley's best interests. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, mm, they like really yeah. cared about him. You know, the not la- saying that anybody else yeah. didn't care about him, but I'm just saying is that, you know, if they would have had the proper representation, if he would have had the people that would. This is that what they do? This is their job. This is what they, you know, that they work True. at. True. Yeah. You know? Well, but hang on. Son hang on. was small time though. He always uh, had to go to RCA. Just and uh, Tom yeah. was. I just want to point out though that like, no matter who was going to manage him, they were always going to take advantage of Elvis Presley, right? Because course, as that I is mean, what happens in most of the industry. So, that aside, the last thing I want to say about Tom Hanks' performance here, it's why I think Tom Hanks was so good in this role is because outside. I've never seen Tom Hanks in that slimy, like, villainous role. But when he plays that, when he's manipulating Elvis with that fatherly tenderness, it's where Tom Hanks comes through as Tom Hanks, obviously, right? And you can see the malice in his performance. It was great. I actually, I think Tom Hanks uh, really killed it in this one. Uh, Is it going to be Oscar nominee? I don't know because I can't say that I've seen many. (laughs) Uh, but, it won't. And you know what it is? I, I will say this again. Um, this was a Tom Hanks movie. How he got second billing to Austin Butler is beyond me because this was his. This was. This was. I might agree with you there. This is actually Colonel Tom Parker's uh-huh. story in a weird way. Yeah, it's his. Um, it's his story where he's yeah. portraying himself as the hero in the story. Which is what I also appreciate about Baz Luhrmann's movie is that a lot of these biopics, which 
well, something that's so annoying about them is that they're like, this is the true story about what happened to Freddie Mercury or Elton John or whoever else they've been Yeah, I haven't hearing. seen those. I haven't seen them either. And this movie <laughs> <laughs> is like, this is a fantasy. He's in fucking Vegas Purgatory. And this isn't even Elvis's movie. This is fucking Colonel Tom Parker's movie. And we're going to educate you a little bit about who the fuck Elvis and these guys were. But like, strap in, because this is a fucking, we're taking you on a ride for a show. And that's something I really appreciated about it, too, because I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, you have to tell me the facts and all this stuff. But like, I don't think this movie was concerned about being like historically accurate as much as it was telling this like story of Colonel and Elvis and everything that was important to that dynamic. Now, I didn't love Colonel. I mean, it's just a whole personal preference. I think of like me, like I, I, I don't like it when I'm too aware of the fact that you are just Tom like you're who you are and like you're trying to disappear in a role you can't i i don't care in top gun maverick that it's tom cruise because he's not disappearing in the role but like tom hanks is really trying to disappear into the colonel and he's not doing it for me so like mm. in that regard it didn't work okay but and i'm not a tom hanks stan like i'm not like one of these people who's just like oh my god tom hanks I'm no i know i know you're not so yeah, uh, you, we just have different opinions on this one i get it oh yeah, yeah, yeah. but i really do think that Austin Butler really did a good job. Um, he had big shoes to fill when it comes to Elvis, and I could tell that motherfucker did his homework because I've mm. watched the same exact YouTube clips 90 times in a row, and I was like, oh, my God. He's mo- <laughs> he's accurately moving like Elvis did in this comeback special performance, mm-hmm. if the, in the If I Can Dream performance, in this Vegas Suspicious Mind performance. And then in the way that you know he uh, responds... I thought he did it like when he's actually being like human Elvis and not on stage and just like mimicking his performances like he's convincing. Granted, I have complaints, Mummer. but overall, Mama. I do think he was good, especially because in those montage moments, um, there were times where it was actually Elvis. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, wow, this is doing such a good job that I can't tell the scenes and where it's actually Elvis versus Austin. Oh, wait, was it? I actually was looking through the because I know the parts you're talking about. There's like montages. They have like multi cuts. And you see different mm-hmm. angles. Are you sure? Because mm-hmm. it looked like it was. I kept looking. It's just like they're using real footage. I'm positive. Tell. Okay. I'm positive. I'll take your Especially word for it. Especially the beginning but... and the 70s ones. Um, and then, of course, at the end, you see like the sh- the close up of Austin. Yes. And then the... becomes a close up of Elvis. Yes. That's the big. That's like, okay, they're like telling you. Um, but 100% sure. Also, in the beginning, Austin does all his own singing, but 70s and like mid 60s on, that's all actual Elvis mm. singing. And I don't, th- and I think there's a lot of people who either think he did all his singing or he did none of his singing. And that's impressive because nobody can really tell the difference. Right. Well, he's, you know, a it's glee star. It's a, it's a, he just, he did a good enough job. It's a week of glee stars, right? Leah Michelle got her role in Funny Girl. In Funny Girl, yes. Um, my complaints on his Elvis is a personal thing is that i've seen every almost every elvis movie and i've seen all of his performances and stuff elvis was a bit of an awkward little goofball he laughed a lot on stage and he made uncomfortable jokes because he was kind of uncomfortable Mm -hmm. like when the spotlight was on him too much he just wanted to kind of make a joke out of it to make himself more comfortable and his elvis wasn't goofy enough Mm. he just wasn't he was almost too serious and he was i was like why aren't you laughing more but that's also because Elvis surrounded himself with what they called the Memphis Mafia, friends of his from Memphis mm-hmm. that he hung. Around. It's like as if you got really, really famous, but you still chose to hang around with like Le- Whitman and Levi or whatever. Never. Nah, no, and, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. And like they were your posse for like 20 years. Like that's that's who the Memphis Mafia was. Childhood fucking friends from like personal friends. And that's who Elvis spent the majority of his time with. And all they did was like joke around. And he like all these videos of him just like goofing around with them. They don't even really properly introduce one, the Memphis mafia in the movie, but two, like there's not enough scenes of him just kind of joking around with them because also they also kind of stunted him. Yeah. Even though they were his friends, he was also their employer. So they like, right. They were yes men. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. Well, again, since this is the Colonel story. We're getting it from his point of view. He is right. only seeing the cash cow. That is Elvis. So he just kept calling them the hillbillies, I think, or the rednecks, right? The hillbillies, yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, he had absolutely no empathy towards Elvis's posse and family, even. Because all for him, it was a game of chess. Like, all he wanted was that payday at the end. 
Or, yeah. or he just wanted to keep milking the cash cow. Well, okay. That's a solid defense. Um, I guess I just though still wanted him to be more goofy. Yeah. And that's just and that's um, just my defense in terms of like like I guess I see your point of view and like I think considering like this is we I, I agree with you. This is I said this because I even said this before the movie came out. I was like, Tom Hanks is getting second billing to Austin Butler. And then when I see the movie, just like Tom Hanks deserves top. Like Tom Hanks, if he's going to put a nomination in, like him submit himself for a nomination, it should be best actor, not supporting actor. Right. Austin Butler was a supporting actor here. My opinion here. But um, but yeah, I, I, I think that's why at least you can excuse why we don't get to focus so much on like Elvis because we're looking at this through. The point of view of uh, of the colonel who just sees him nothing but dollar signs. Yeah, yeah. Did you think Austin Butler did a good job? Yeah, I think I think he did a very good job by the end of it. I, by the end, I liked his performance. I think some parts of it were s- I, I I I don't know if it was a writing or if it was a performance, but like you were supposed to take care of us, daddy. <laughs> like that, I thought was just like ugh, cringy. Um, <laughs> Or like when 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 he gets in a fight with Mama, it's just like you're never happy, Mama, Mama. <laughs> it's like he said this. It sounded it bored the it's, it's moments like that, which are supposed to be like very dramatic, ended up feeling like a Cher impersonation. Whoa, like you know Jack McFarlane yeah, yeah. Per, uh, performing as Cher. But uh-huh. overall, considering this is a two and a half hour movie, I think he did a very good job. I just want to say that. You do a pretty good Elvis impersonation. Do I? Thank you. Oh, this, yeah, that's like my drag right impersonation of what Elvis should be. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just listening to you do those voices. I'm like, oh, wow. I hear Elvis in that. That was pretty good. Um, you know, it's hard because, again, Elvis is so ubiquitous. And like everyone, oh, like, like very much. Like everyone has, in t- has done impersonations of him. He's actually very easy to impersonate. So when a person's going up there and doing like a whole two hour and a half performance of him, it's bound to get a little funny because of our relationship mm-hmm. to the image of Elvis. Yeah. Um, I think, so I think that's, that's why maybe I think he took him a little too seriously is because he wanted to like really uh, show him as like a, a human being mm-hmm. instead of just an, a, a media figure. Well, yeah. And you keep saying seriously, I don't think, so I don't think this Elvis was necessarily serious. I think he was naive. Is the Elvis that they were portraying here, right? Well, he was certainly naive. Like he, yes. they were, all these people around him were warning him of the Colonel in their own way, and he was too naive to see it. We have scenes with Priscilla, he was just a country boy, warning yeah. him, and then we have his mother warning him. We have BB uh, King warning him. Uh, oh, that reminds me. Pause. Best performance of the fucking movie was the guy who played Little Richard. Yes, he was good. He yes. was so good. Yes. Oh, I thought, yeah. I genuinely thought it was, he was, it that they cast a female to play Little Richard. I'm like, that's bold. But it's just like, I just think it was just uh, a very, he had this feminine feature, but great performance. This, I mean, this, now I want to see a Little Richard movie with this guy playing, yeah. to be quite honest. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, a Little Richard movie would actually be really fun. Because mm-hmm. um, he was quite the performer. And oh, quite the person. such a performer. Um. Yeah, so I, I'm saying he took him seriously as in the way he approached the role mm. and the way that he wanted to pers- uh, you know, portray Elvis. Um, and I think he, yeah, I think that Elvis was taken advantage of. And in some ways, Elvis let himself be taken advantage of. But the way he uh, chose to in those moments, you know, like I just, I think that he just had, he should have had a little bit more fun with Elvis mm. in those like moments where we're getting to know him. I mean, yeah, Elvis's life was really tragic at times, especially after he lost, you know, his mother, his like closest confidant and whatever. And like, he really wanted to hit those beats and those emotional beats. But like in those other scenes, like we, we are introduced to the Memphis mafia and then they're like on a lot in, on the MGM studio or something. And then he's like yelling at the, the Memphis mafia. Yeah. Like, well, why, why, why aren't you joking around with them first? That did feel, first. It did feel a little out of place. That's yeah. uh, that that moment because like show me the true Elvis mood swings. I didn't understand why <laughs> he was upset. What was he upset about? Because like, they made fun of him. Because like, shelling. Be, yeah, because Elvis at that point became a joke. But you also didn't really get it because they completely went over his whole movie career, which I get it. His movie career is the worst part of his whole, you know, personal uh, professional career. But really? you have to get to know like how like tragic it was that he was just making these terrible movies after like they the movies were good and then they just started getting bad and then they got fucking terrible. Mm-hmm. So like you need 
we needed to understand that better in order for us to also understand why his comeback special was so important mm. and why the colonel wasn't necessarily for a comeback special and elvis was right they didn't they didn't you know whatever yeah personal personal things okay. but i mean you're the his, um, you're the elvis buff here <laughs> well yeah so ask me some questions that you had about the movie um i cannot say that i had at the moment, off the top of my head, any real questions? I don't know. I think mm-hmm. the movie was pretty straightforward. Eddie, did you okay. did you have any questions? Okay. I know that he had a very loving relationship with his mother. They were oh, like here we go. very, very close. There were moments I was just feeling like, this is a little strange the way they're portraying this. Yeah. Uh, I'm actually glad that you felt that way. Because I do think that Elvis had a really complicated relationship with women in general. And that was because of his overbearing mother. Um, what's that complex that men Edible. have? No, M- uh, Madonna whore. Oh, Madonna whore complex. That is, uh, yeah. yeah. Elvis had that complex about women. So for our audience and I who do don't, think, oh wait, for the audience yes. who don't know what Madonna whore complex, Madonna whore complex is the idea that men will not treat the mother of their children like a slut, right? So they're a little more tender with them and stuff. So that's why they, it's an excuse to cheat because the whore you can treat however you want, but not the yeah. Madonna. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That is my interpretation of the thing. Eddie's looking at me like I'm way off. I'm pretty sure that's I mean, it. like, there's a little bit more complexity to it, but, like, mm-hmm. essentially women fall into two categories. Um, and, you know, you, you look at women as either a sexual object or as, like, a motherly figure. Mm-hmm. And, he, yeah, his mother was incredibly protective of him, and he, and he loved it. He was a mama's boy. Um, so yeah, their relationship, like, I'm glad you got that because it was probably a little like, this is too much, you know, like everyone who's a mama's boy knows that like their mother is maybe Freudianly weirdly in love with her son in a way. It's like weird, (laughs) you know, but Mm -hmm. like these relationships happen all the time. I had one question. Um, So that was true. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. uh, Regarding women. So Elvis Presley only married, uh, Priscilla. Priscilla. Yes. Oh, well, I don't know why. I thought he had like multiple wives and stuff. He had multiple girlfriends. No, yeah, really I mean, married her. many, many um, sluts, I'm sure. <laughs> so I'm surprised you're not asking me more about Priscilla. And that's also probably because the movie, I don't think, does a good job in portraying Priscilla. Um, but that's because I happen to really love Priscilla. Is she it? wrote a really great book uh-huh. called Elvis and Me, and she, where uh-huh. she tells about their relationship. Okay, the big thing is when did he meet her, right? Yeah, when they were in Germany, right? Yeah. Okay. The movie kind of addresses this, but it doesn't. Priscilla was 14 years old when she met him. Oh. Mm. How old was he? Uh, 21. 18, 21. Oh. 20, 21. Okay. Um, huge age difference, right? Big. I mean, uh, she's a child. It, she is a child. 1950s uh, contemporary of Elvis was Jerry Lee Lewis, and we all know that he married his 13-year-old cousin, right? So apparently in the 50s, this was common. I mean, if you look to the South, I'm pretty sure child brides are still a thing. So. I'm I'm sure they still are a thing. I really some, dig it on the South this episode. Like, we're yeah. going to get a lot of backlash. <laughs> but according to Priscilla in her book, Elvis and Me, um, they never slept with each other until they married when she was uh, 18 years old. Mm-hmm. Okay, sure. They never, like, did the peen in the vagine, but I'm sure there was a lot of... <laughs> this, this is according to her in the book she wrote after he died, and she was like, she swore that they didn't and okay. that she wanted to, but most of the time she would come over and he would be too... Like, he would sleep until, like, 1 o'clock in the afternoon and she would just want to be there with him. Who is he, the time traveler's wife now? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, recall to one of our past episodes. So there was a problematic thing there, right? Because like, as an Elvis fan, I'm like, oh, he met Priscilla when she was 14. That's a fucking, that's creepy. Yeah, because she didn't look um, like she was 14. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's because of that where her parents, you know, she kind of does say that her parents were just happy that she was getting like, uh, an in with the movie star, you know, as all these fucking parents do. And that, you know, they married, they had, she had Lisa Marie and that after she had Lisa Marie, Elvis just didn't want to like have sex with her anymore. And that she pretty much was like, well, if you're not going to actually be a loving husband to me, then I'm going to leave you. He did not respond well to being left, obviously. And that at one point he even like considered hiring. This is, this is what the drugs will fucking do to you. 
Well, mm-hmm. and considered hiring someone to kill her new boyfriend, and the Memphis Mafia had to talk him out of it. And then he was like, "Yeah, I can't believe I was actually going to do that." And they uh, laughed about it later. There's your movie. <laughs> <laughs> there's right like there. things that didn't make it in the fucking movie it might be in the four um, hour cut um yeah i guess so la- those are oh. that's those are the controversial things that i'm like is this movie going to address and i'm like i guess this isn't the place to do it because it's colonel's movie yeah, like, like it's the colonel tom parker and elvis's movie but we should know this about elvis yeah, right sure i know it about care. elvis so like colonel. oh well no none of the men cared like yeah so. like colonel was just like yeah. i she's eating into your paycheck sir not mine <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, last question. last is question: Is Doctor Nick real? Doctor Nick? Yeah, Doctor Nick was the doctor who would be. I'm. Ass- I assume was injecting him with morphine. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm, is, mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, those, or those. Adrenaline. Yeah, I'm sure there were other doctors. Yeah, they but, kept referring uh, to him as just the good Doctor Nick. <laughs> like, yeah. Know, throughout the whole yeah. thing. No, at, at the end, yeah, he oh. was just surrounded by yes men at the end. Yeah. And his father, yeah. he was just a pawn in Colonel's game master plan, right? Or was he just a terrible business manager? Um, both. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but like, yeah, again, Elvis surrounded himself with a very close knit little circle. So like, there's room for like delusions and all this stuff that happened there. Yeah, this is, you know, yeah. because he didn't like everyone was too afraid to tell him things. Yeah, this is why my um, mom has asked me he's like oh you should give your sister a job for your llc she could like be your sister i'm like absolutely not i'm not mixing family with my business yeah eddie could only be in here when we're recording for example. <laughs> <laughs> so i'm surprised you're not asking me the big question was did elvis really steal black music oh do you feel the movie addressed that i actually do you feel- think i think i mean the movie kind of explained that he necessarily didn't steal intentionally he was mm-hmm. it was the music that he listened to and grew up with and uh it's a music that he wanted to perform and as a result marketers exploited it i think that's pretty yeah and i believe that i that's not a hard thing to believe right like he he didn't go out of his way stealing music that he was just like oh this is the music that i want to perform and then you see the marketers at like the record label saying it's like oh yeah you perform that it's to your heart's content we're gonna make a pretty penny out of it yeah no, I I don't think that's hard to believe either. I, of course, I am an Elvis fan too, but like, I do. Th- I don't think he went out there with bad intentions of stealing black people's music. I think that that again. I just I'm gonna say what you just said because you said it perfectly. Like he was genuinely influenced by it, and you know, greedy media was just like, well, we're gonna capitalize on this. But um, was he racist? With with 2022 though, like looking back on it, you know, like is that though problematic? It's interesting because I felt like the movie was aware of those arguments and almost tried a little too hard to, to like make Elvis look like oh no he was like he was cool he, he was down with and the he was black like folk. yeah and he yeah exactly yeah. well yeah <laughs> so, it was like, so yeah which is my question so like was Elvis racist in real life or was he very friendly with the black community no no he wasn't racist that we um, know of yeah i mean i i I never knew him personally Uh (laughs) but like he he worked alongside many black people and he was influenced by black musicians yeah um but when he recorded hound dog it wasn't like the movie portrayed it where he was like i'm gonna do big mama thornton's record there was actually another white uh, rock and roll band that had done a version of Hound Dog mm. and he was just like oh that's a good song that I want to cover like these guys did I want to do it like them I think I mentioned this on our episode yeah, where we talked about on our, music, uh, covers our too. music covers episode yeah um, but you know there are a lot of um, black artists of his contemporary time that feel conflicted about him I know Ray Charles hasn't like been like the biggest fan of him but Little Richard fucking loved him Isn't you can Ray like Charles YouTube dead? any they're both Ray dead Ray Charles is dead I think they're both dead yeah <laughs> So you could, you know, YouTube both of them hearing. And it's like, they're both valid, you know, and like Ray Charles is upset because, yeah, like he, he, people associate music that black artists had a wrote and, and Elvis got famous for it, you mm-hmm. know, but, you know, on one hand that could be a good thing because then it actually brought attention to these artists and their music, you know, and that's uh. why in the sixties things had changed, mm-hmm. you know, there's two sides of looking at it. So I think the movie though, really did try and like be like hey guys he's cool especially when like doja cat started playing and stuff I yeah was like okay baz i see you. <laughs> this is my question that i had for you uh how do you feel about the inclusion of like hip-hop in 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 this movie so i, I have it's not even the hip-hop that was jarring per se because this is a movie about music 
the music that they're recording some of the time. So like to have contemporary music show up oh, in only two scenes, right? It wasn't like continuously throughout the whole film. It was only literally in two scenes where you had two contemporary music uh, songs play. Oh, your thoughts? It didn't... Okay, like it wasn't the biggest bother because i've seen like westerns where rock and roll songs will sure. play or whatever like but i've seen is it continuous music from a different time play in in a f- like okay hip-hop wasn't around the 50s why am i hearing this but i do think that it was an obvious put in there for like the kids mm, okay yeah I, and it was more so that i think once is fine me. right but like twice randomly i think it's just like huh like it didn't carry over throughout the whole film so this way it was weird yeah, it just, yeah, it was just a little too, like, I know you're trying to be cool, but, you know, the Elvis movie soundtrack is number one right now, and it's, like, the first soundtrack that I've listened to in years for a movie. Well, that's a little bias on your part. <laughs> oh, it's totally biased on my part, but it's also, like, he's got uh, Doge Cat, Eminem, and CeeLo Green on it, um... All these other people that I don't know because I don't listen to music, but I'm like, I think they're famous. I wonder if Memphis and it's like, Bleak wow. is in it. I know Tame and Paula did a remix. Um, I know them. Tim and Paula. I know Paula? Mark Ronson did something. Okay. Yeah. Um, like they, he got a lot of recent musical artists to uh, to contribute to this album, hmm. which um, you know, like he turned into an event. Like, of course, Baz Luhrmann would do that. Sure. And to me, that's actually like, wow! I remember when this used to be a thing, and it just got me excited for the movie going experience. Mm-hmm. That's um, cool. I saw this movie with a shitload of Elvis fans because I went to a fan early access event and. Uh, Everyone was wearing like their shirts, just like me, and they gave us free posters at the end. Did and everyone anyone applauded dress up like the Elvis? End. They didn't dress up like Elvis. They just <sighs> like drew with you their. Guys they came with their Elvis shirts and stuff. So you might not be allowed uh, to, wh- <laughs> to dress uh, at, in theaters after the Aurora shooting. I think they kind of banned cosplay at theaters. Oh, that's such a shame. Yeah, but I get it. So, I yeah. get it. Let's get to the important but, question. How about this? Ready? Yeah. All right. How much has this film made worldwide, do you think? I know how much. <laughs> you do know. Go <laughs> ahead. I looked it up because I was interested in so whether or not this film was a success or not. Okay. Um, worldwide, I believe this film has made already $155 million. $157 million. Close. $157. Yes. Look at that. Uh, two million. Which since, since you the were. movie has about, what What was its budget? Do you know that? that it, I, d- I know it was less than $100 million. Um, Elvis budget, and they shot in Australia, so there was. Did they? they? Good. F- mm-hmm. It was an eighty-five million U.S. uh U.S. dollars. So that's good because yeah, so it profited. It's at it's at it's a profit. Profited. It's it it well, you as you say, like usually you double whatever you put in production for marketing. So it'll be breaking even at the moment. But if we just go by the production cost alone, it's making a profit. It is okay, and it's eighteen. Um, I mean, you know. I, I was so worried that it would be a flop. And so the fact that it's not is just great. Yeah, I think because it's, it's it's doing, it's performing. Is it the it movie of the summer? Absolutely not. We all know no, what it's movie not. of the summer it, is. It was the movie of my summer. It, it's but, Top Gun Maverick. Uh, it, Top Gun Maverick was like the, right movie now, the, summer, is yeah. the movie it's, of the summer. So far, it's the movie of the year. <laughs> so far, yeah. Which is... <laughs> it's number one still, Mind-boggling yeah. how like this yeah. movie, this revival would be like so fucking well done. Anyway. Like beat Disney and Marvel, like wow, Paramount, good for you. But are you surprised that the Elvis movie is doing as well as it is financially speaking, at least? Um, I mean, there's still a lot of old audiences out there, right? <laughs> COVID ain't gotten them all. <laughs> so you really think that that's it? It's like the boomers that are seeing it. You don't think there's many people like me in, in uh, our age group that are interested in it? I don't think no, so. W- w- in the theaters. Well, we went. Mm-hmm. Everybody there. We had. You're right. They were about our age. It was like the six Maybe. people that went. No, there was more. Yeah. There were like a handful more, but it was. But it was also like the last showing at like uh, on a Monday. So I'm not. I'm so not that's actually everyone. impressive for a movie uh, that's been out for a month. Yeah, when yeah. I bought the tickets, it was empty, and I was just like, "Oh, Eddie, the theater's empty. I can't wait to like be able to talk loudly." <laughs> and then there were people, and I'm just like, "God damn it!" Um, no, do I, I don't know. Like so. On a personal level, like anecdotally, right? Like anyone around my age group who I mentioned, I'm going to go see the Elvis movie. They're just like, there's an Elvis movie or 
Um, it's just like, oh, why? Right? Like, I don't think... So, at least from my circle of friends, no one is necessarily interested in seeing Levi the Elvis Whitman? movie. Levi Whitman. I texted it to Ryan, for example, who is a client also. Uh, mm. So, you know. but I, you know. Yeah, the, move, the people around my age that I know are going to see this movie are either really people who are really into movies or Elvis fans. Mm. It It's not necessarily the type of movie that is like a frequent movie goer who doesn't care about Elvis would go see. Um, it hasn't really appealed. I don't think on that way. And I kind of expected that. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought it would be more of a miracle if it did, but I don't think, I don't know if it did. It might do well it has with it. streaming once. It uh, might. Cause I, this is a Warner brothers production, right? Yes. So it'll probably go to HBO Max. <gasps> oh my God, that just got me really excited. <laughs> Why? Because <laughs> it's going to be on HBO Max like any day now. Actually, yeah, pretty soon. Like usually, again. I think they play it for 21 days and then they'll stream to HBO Max as like their model. So it's a good chance well, it'll probably yeah. be within the next week or so, you'll probably have it on, uh, on HBO Max. Yeah. So it's interesting because we always end with like, oh, is this film needed? Or, well, we're trying to change that. And we quite haven't come up with the question. Mm-hmm. But it's interesting because in this day and age the story of elvis do you think the story needed to be told i mean <laughs> the story of a uh, celebrity getting elvis exploited. and his colonel tom parker i yeah. was gonna say the story of a celebrity getting exploited by their management team is just like tale as old as time <laughs> you know so yeah well we're hearing these stories more and more though because our biopics used to be like oh they were their own worst enemies and the drugs that they got into did them but like well no actually Someone created this monster. Right. Um, what was your question? Do you think this was a story that kind of needed to be told? Yeah, you know what? I would say yes, because I didn't know it. I only knew Elvis, like I said, as the fat guy who died on the toilet, I think is what I, my, I was led to believe he died. Yes, he died in the bathroom. Do you think... Did he, did he die on the toilet? I don't know if he died on the toilet, but he was in the bathroom. Um, my God, do you wiping, probably <laughs> very uh, strenuous, you know? Is your perception of him as a performer has it changed? Um, no, but that's because I didn't see. It, I saw a performance of Elvis, someone performing as Elvis. I didn't see Elvis, so um, do you want to see Elvis? Probably not. <laughs> If I'm going to be honest. Am I going to like also seek out his music? Also, probably not. Okay. So your perception, you weren't like, oh, I didn't know that Elvis actually did this type of music and that he was this kind of performer. That's actually that. No, that, that all that, that, that I've I've learned about Elvis for sure. And like, I saw the tragedy and I think that's like, okay, that's cool. Um, Whether or not I'm going to become like, I'm not like going to like seek out, like looking at Elvis's old concerts and listening to his music. It's not my cup of tea but i'm not gonna yeah but still like but you but you did like oh wow like i didn't know that he you know gave these kind of shows and he poured his out on this way or whatever exactly this is this okay so it did do that at least i mean was he really that heartbroken about robbie kennedy's death i didn't know that people cared about (laughs) (laughs) i think i don't know if he was heartbroken but he he knew he he needed to is that jfk it was like his cousin (laughs) It was Bobby. Bobby Kennedy. It was brother. his brother, first brother. of all. A brother. My yeah, God. Brother. I, my, Are you serious? My history teacher is so he disappointed was, in me in I mean, high school. You're right. It was, oh, jeez. But he was also like a slated. senator. He, but he was also it, slated it, for like. Yeah, I think he yeah, was. Like, he was going to be like he was. Yeah. John. Everyone was unhappy with like Johnson and like, you know, with the changes that Kennedy made. They're like, we're going to there's still hope for us. And that got all fucked when he again was murdered. I don't like political dynasties. So. <laughs> Yeah, but the Kennedys, they, they could have done something. They couldn't. I mean, they were. I mean, I still believe that they had somewhat of a hand in the death of Marilyn Monroe. But, you know, they could have made a difference. <laughs> they were different. They were the last different ones. Uh, Everyone else has sucked since. Everyone. But not Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter never stood a chance. That's not the same. That's not to say that he himself wasn't one of the few good politicians we had. He also made that connection with Casho to let the the uh, the prisons loose. I mean, that's what Scarface. Have you not seen Scarface? That was Jimmy Carter's doing. <laughs> he let Castro <laughs> empty out his prisons into Miami Beach. Hello. Um, <laughs> but yeah. So anyway, enough of that political talk. Uh, Eddie, 
Any last minute things you want to say about the movie? We haven't heard too much from you. Oh uh, no, I did. I did enjoy it. Um, definitely learned some things, um, or, or you know, didn't realize how impactful this relationship was in his life. I mean, you don't sometimes, you know, sometimes you just like, you know, I, I like the music, I uh, like some of his movies, you know, but never thought about like what goes behind the scenes and and. And and more and more, we, we need to start questioning. I mean, we 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 consume these, we're entertained by it, but we have to ask ourselves at, at what price of the people mm-hmm. that are are the actors, the performers, musicians. You know, what 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 are we supporting here? You know, are we supporting their career? But there there's something behind it. There are executive producers. There are people doing things, and um and 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 then we make judgment. You know, when something happens, when they they go nuts or um, they drug overdose and we make assumptions of like, yeah, yeah, they were drug addicts or blah, blah, blah. But yeah. we don't, we don't think about this. There's so much more going on there. There's so much more happening. Why are you smiling? Because this reminded me of like <laughs> the kind of biopics that I tend to like, which are there's, a, apparently one type of biopic that I gravitate towards. I'll never watch them. I watch like the highlights on YouTube, but they are the lifetime unauthorized biopics that are just sensationalists. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Those yeah, are great. Yeah. Those are the nitty gritty shit that like you like. Um, terribly cast. This was so sensationalist. This was. And I think this is why I, I ended up liking this one more so than like a lot of the biopics I've seen in the mm. past. You know what I mean? Like I think mm-hmm. maybe my favorite biopic has been What's Love Got to Do With It? Oh uh, yeah, yeah that's, that's a good, a good one. one. Um, yeah. And uh, but other than that, like I don't really, I, I, it's not the genre that I gravitate towards. And uh, me uh, neither, to be completely honest. Yeah. So. Although I will say, like if focusing again, focusing on the bad guy, kind of great. I think kind of smart, and I kind of mm-hmm. want to see just like, okay, what celebrity will we do next? Because I know they're doing a Whitney Houston biopic. But it's by the they same are, people yes. who did Bohemian Rhapsody. So I can only, it's going to be like... Yeah, oh no, it's going like, to be terrible. Yeah, it's going to be Wait, like... you don't know? What? Madonna is directing her own biopic. So there's gonna, so we might be able to cover that because I think there's another one that's coming out that was unauthorized but like has all the license to the music. And that's why she's doing it. <laughs> oh, is it? Interesting. <laughs> I don't know if I want to see a Madonna-directed movie about her life. But you know that Madonna would never let anyone else direct her own story. Uh, That's just so Madonna. Okay, this has this has legs. Um, Yeah, yeah. Well, the next one we're doing is Blonde. So who? We're gonna do the one about Marilyn. Oh, (laughs) (laughs) but no. Wait. Always makes me laugh the way Rolando says "who." (laughs) That's my Uh, favorite thing. The no, no, no. But there is a biopic that I do want to see. It's unauthorized. It's called Aline. It's about Celine Dion, but it's unauthorized. So, so they called her Aline. And so she's called Aline. But here's That's the great. wild thing. I saw it on TikTok, and they mentioned it on the Taylor Strecker show this morning. But here's oh. the wild part. The parts of the five-year-old Celine Dion are played by the same 55-year-old woman. They just superimpose <laughs> her face on the body of the child and as a teenager, right? And apparently it's like the most jarring thing in the world. And... Are there any videos or clips on this? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know there what? I'm gonna to have the, I'm gonna post those on my uh, on on our show notes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but like, how absolutely bonkers does that sound? But they wow. have the rights to the music. That's wow! <laughs> I got to see this movie so, now. You yeah. just sold me on it. Aline is what it's called, and this is the bio. The, my next biopic that I will watch because it sounds absolutely. <laughs> bonkers I horrifying can't, like, in its own way yeah uh, wow. I, I, I i discovered it on my tiktok because someone showed the clips and they're like it's a child with an old lady's face on it, on it oh my god it. i crazy. gotta see this i gotta see this <laughs> so yeah so anyway um that's it i think you should go see elvis listeners if you haven't consider it even if you're like i don't know about bass Lerman, give it a sh- i mean you're gonna be in for a wild ride so you should bu- buckle up but it's gonna be an experience. Mm-hmm. And if you have seen it, you should share your thoughts with us. 
Email us, remakes, reboots, revivals at gmail.com. Instagram at remakes, reboots, revivals. Twitter at remakes podcast. You could share your thoughts with us by leaving us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. Those ratings and reviews really do help our listenership grow. Yep. And if you want to actually phone in and share some thoughts, you should call our voicemail service and leave us a voicemail. And that number is 862-248-2326. That's 862-248-2326. Well, Elvis has left the building, and uh, we got to go, too. So mm-hmm. until next week, stay, stay in original. original.